So I put th together this presentation. It's what I'll be doing is sort of demystifying what the art world is in order to remystify sort of the role of the artist from a Christian perspective. And what I want to do is expound upon how the normalization of decadence that we see and the irreverence is, it's greatly brought down our collective aesthetic standards. And I'm going to try to crystallize what actually our common sense already knows about the radical left, but from the vantage point of the arts. So um, the art world is a three-tiered stacked pyramid, just so you understand it, what it is exactly first. And way at the top, the art industry is a financial instrument for billionaires to money launder and evade taxes. That's why 50% of purchases are by 20 collectors through five galleries. Marion Goodman Gallery, Hauser and Worth, Gagosian, David Zwerner, and Pace. All right, so in the middle is uh, where I have most of my clout, and that's sort of the Wild West. I would say 85% are cultural Marxists, and they're basically promoting social justice with this activist-oriented art, and 15% are like actual technical artisans, and they just love their craft. And this is where you have your solo shows, group exhibitions, the festival circuit, uh, what have you. And way down at the bottom, you have like actual appreciation of aesthetics. So the critique, art collectives, art history courses, you know, what here in the West we, we call food for the soul is sort of dismissed as secondary in a very frivolous fashion. The art world is not even about art. And uh, I believe this must change. Obviously, the problem is that it's totally upside down. So I'm going to start with a little story first. You know, it's the same 21st century story of man falling in love with his creations wherever you go. So this young man comes to the Lord and says, Father, I no longer need your blessing. Yes, you are the original creator, but anything you can produce, I can now do so with my own hands. I have my technology, my education, and most importantly, these intricately designed hands. With my own hands, I built cities, skyscrapers that go beyond 100 feet. With my own hands, I built the internet and social media connecting the entire planet. And with my own hands, I built art, influencing the culture beyond my wildest dreams. And the Lord looks upon this young man and says, nice, but first, create your hands. <laughs> so when we look at Genesis here, um, when you read Genesis, you will see visual communication self-reflection, and creation very evident. But when you excavate it a little bit further, it implies that the process of creation must be purpose-driven. You know, and more obviously is when Christians do this with their progeny. But it's also important to understand that this is meant to be done artistically as well. So I'm going to share a little bit about myself, if you don't mind. Um, my mother is a classical composer at the level of university, and my father is a senior pastor for our family church. Uh, we are a traditional Christian family full of artists, and we're very, very odd in that way. We have dancers, you know, musicians, uh, actors. Um, I have memory after memory of my siblings and I appreciating style, pedagogy, and symbolism all in the name of God. My mother would play cello or piano for the congregation. My sister would play the violin or sing. My brother would do a lot of the youth work. He'd also coach a lot of basketball. And during holidays, he would actually act out scenes of the Bible with some of the other kids. So the creative investment we had to the community uh, was very strong. But everything I just told you is a performative art, right? So if you see a comedian, you see their facial animations with the timing of the jokes. If you see a dancer, you see the elongated form, uh, their gesture. If you see a, if you hear a singer, it's their, you can hear their voice coming out of their mouth. And here I am as this weird introvert who goes into a room and throws paint pigments around, right? 
So I always felt a little bit displaced with his family. And my father, he noticed that displacement. So he shared the story of Bezalel and Exodus with me. So Bezalel is the first man in the Bible that is filled with the Spirit of God. A fine artist. Not a prophet, not a king, that classless ranked introvert, right? Who doesn't care about your 350 pound bench press or your deadly sports car, right? He is the example of what an artist is supposed to be as restorers of the sacred. And artists are supposed to be servants, and our role is to preserve and restore the sacred. And the Lord commissioned Bezalel to produce beauty through the tabernacle. Else here. All right, the tabernacle, uh, it's called the tent of meeting also, or the dwelling place of God. This took 48, 15-foot-tall gold ornamental pillars, and these pillars were wrapped with these architectural reliefs around them. And, you know, we had, like, these animals and these dramatic poses to these different archetypes that exist within our psyche, just really decoratively done. This image does no justice, actually. Uh, beyond these, in between these columns were these big sheets of ram skin dyed in rich purples, you know, which required, like, certain beetle skin and animal blood and dirt, and it's very assiduous to produce. So um, this was fabulous by all accounts. If we saw the tabernacle today in its perfection, we would think it's like an extraterrestrial phenomenon, right? Because the entire village over-donated to produce this marvelous feat. Beauty in this case was the ultimate sacrifice for our Lord. We all recognize God granting Moses the Ten Commandments, and it demonstrates law and expectations. We all recognize God granting Aaron and his descendants priesthood, and it demonstrates reconciliation towards the light. But Christians need to also recognize God granting Bezalel the talent of art making towards maintaining beauty, ergo social cohesion. So when you read Exodus here, it says, Then God said to Moses, See, I have chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God with wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge, and here's the key thing, and with all kinds of skills to make bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood, and to engage in all kinds of crafts. Now, when you look at the ancients across all civilizations, they regard reason, beauty, good, and truth as the fundamental building blocks of their society. Now, you notice beauty is up there. But we need to be clear, what it, what, when they talk about beauty, they're talking about the sacred. That is what we have to imply when we use this word in this historical sense. And as our society becomes more antithetical and polarized, just as a reminder, we've all been here before. Every empire falls from the inside out, and the men become spoiled from the fruits of their fathers, and that same toxicity will then ventriculate to the creative class. And the artist will then transition from that preserver of truth to the spreader of vanity. And the praise aesthetics of the time will give you hindsight of what the culture is, which is why the most popular form of art today in mainstream America is hip hop and gangster rap. Because it's, look at it as a phenomena, it's all pseudo masculinity as an overcompensation for not having benevolent fatherhood. You just have to look at the single motherhood rate in the black community and how that, that is exasperating in every demographic. So there's, that's the connection as to why that phenomena is occurring in the first place. So there have been a lot of modern figures that are popular right now in the mainstream that have been pointing towards the same direction. They call it the logos. Um, Carl Jung is a popular one. Joseph Campbell, Jordan Peterson is the most modern form. And I believe we need those men strategically because they force the atheist intellectual types to recognize that you can never find morality and pure materiality. So we need those guys because they kind of uh, 
stabilize that reality tunnel, but they often speak very gray. But I do notice that when they talk about the arts, they are also sharing the same sentiment I'm trying to share with you all, which is that the arts are a necessary form of worship because beauty is far more effective than logic. You've all heard the saying that facts don't care about your feelings, right? I'm here to say feelings don't care about your facts, okay? Um, I should say, these are some of my popular paintings I'll be showing as I talk. So beauty not only convinces secular men to go within, but the very nature of beauty is self-evident, so debate is pointless. The same way a stench from something toxic is ugly. And I believe that once Christians realize that we are the ones who produce the ultimate form of beauty, we can have some confidence in this realm of the arts as well. I also want to note, while we're on the subject of beauty, traditionally, it was men who were the gatekeepers of beauty. Now, when I do these talks about beauty, often when I say beauty, people are getting confused in a secular sense. They think of hotness or something of that sort, right? Um, so when I say beauty, people will think of ranking the opposite sex on a one to 10 rating scale or something of that sort. No, but we're talking about pure beauty, the sacred. Beauty should be something that points upwards. And that was ideally the point of art. Okay, so uh, I was very inspired coming from this family that appreciated classics. And the story of Bezalel really shook me to my bones here. So I entered the gallery scene. And, you know, currently the art world is in dire need of a facelift. It's either very traditional and figurative without any zest or color. There's not much movement. Um, it's not as expressive as it could be. Or it's all vague and miasmic with nothing figurative, and nothing so identifiable. And what I did is I put the two together. So by doing this fusion, I started to get a lot of attention, and I was invited to this residency program that was internationally known called the Eileen S. Kaminsky Family Foundation. And that was a very good way to start because a lot of galleries started to contact me. I got to exhibit in Art Basel. Um, I was covered by White Hype Magazine, Art Verge, all of these uh, you know, popular channels. And world starts to get around very quick. Uh, give a little bit of context. If you are in New York City and you have one solo, solo exhibition annually at 70% of your income, if it's a reputable gallery, I would usually have three to six solos a year. So I had a lot of connection just by that alone. I was invited to, uh, you know, people were taking me out for sushi, Norwood, Manhattan Car Club, all this fancy stuff. And Externally, it, it looked like, you know, Arthur, you've made it, you know? You get to sell your art and make a good living. You're living the dream. But I want to make something clear that if you're living in New York City that is Democrat-run, you're living under the shadow of the woke, you know? And one thing I appreciate about this audience is I can be very blunt, right? You can't be a Democrat in today's sense to be a Christian. And I can just say that to this kind of audience, which is refreshing. Because being a person who's been in New York for 10 years, it's, it's, uh, you're in social camouflage, essentially. And look, I've had, I had an art director who wanted to have an initial meeting at a Black Lives Matter rally. <laughs> and it was under this assumption that I would be like, excited to participate. I've had dozens of critics suggest I depict more female or LGBTQ figures. And they dangle that they would write about my practice further, right? But even with all that, I, I basically kept my mouth shut and focused on the artistic excellence element. I was awarded, I was awarded Artist of the Year in 2019 against a lot of competition. I was uh, flattered to you know, top out my mentors also. <laughs> um, so work cons consistently got around quick and I had a lot of pull with that. So, but again, I think we've been covering the persecution of Christians, and it's obviously it's pivotal that we have this in the forefront of our minds. But if you're working in the arts and entertainment, 
the devil owns all of that, right? So the only way you can get around is if you, for every success had, there's some sort of constricted entitlement waiting for you, basically. So I'll share a funny story with you all that kind of uh, topped where, where I was at a tipping point of the drama. I was invited to this wood fire pizza place. And one of the dealers I was working with was sitting over here. And then there's two artists here. And it's kind of a big table, but this side of the table can hear each other, right? So she invited me because she wanted to do a group exhibition with me and one of her Black Lives Matter artists. And she said, so we can commemorate the Stop Asian Hate Movement, you know, because of these slanted eyes. <laughs> and um, she expected me to be like excited of something of some, you know, that sort. But at this point, I was just kind of fed up. And she said, how do you feel about that? <laughs> and I said, I think it's very odd that blacks assaulting Asians based on race is white supremacy. <laughs> and and, and um, <laughs> right after I said that, right across her, this one girl looks at me. And I can feel the, uh, like the, like the mental hiccup or the program like glitch for a second. Because, because this side of the table felt totally silent, right? Now, they're still talking. It's kind of loud. There's music. But they kind of looked at me like, who is this guy? Why did you invite Like, why is he here? And the young lady across me says, well, what do you think about Black Lives Matter? And she said it like checkmate. Like, she thought I would be, like, like stabilized. And I, I said, uh, this is not a paraphrase, by the way. I said, I think Black Lives Matter is a modern blackface where white liberals like you use the black identities to push your liberal agenda. <laughs> So dead silence here. Um, I mean, how do you think that conversation went moving forward? You know? Yeah. So one plus one is two. And the serious part here is that this is what happens if you're an artist of faith creating towards the light. If you want to work in the mainstream, you basically can't. <laughs> uh, and there's the serious side to this is that I get contacted by hundreds of young artists who want to you know, participate in the mainstream, but they're essentially lining up to the Leviathan. You know, there's no really other way to go about it. So, um, but, but, you know, as that was happening, I, it was really disconcerting because, I, you know, I was thinking about why good men do not speak up. And we like to romanticize that it's because of fear. We're all afraid to speak up. Um, I don't believe that, actually. I think the reason why, you know, we're all adults here. We don't need everyone to like us. The reason why good men don't speak up is actually because they're not in a position of being uncancelable. In other words, if I'm here in my cubicle as an everyday man, and I can say something, I know, I know what in here is correct, and, it's, and it coincides biblically, and I can stand up for what's right, but if I do say so, then this HR lady can castigate my income when I'm looking at my kids here. You know, it's one thing to be hated, it's another to be hated and poor. So it's actually circumstantial. And because not enough people are speaking up, we do, we're not in a milieu to feel comfortable about sharing what's the vehemence inside of us. And I think that's what's actually happening. And I'm reminded of this passage here. And in retrospect, I actually think it's an honor that this occurred, right? Because if you're going to be an actual dissident artist, you're pushing against the dominant narrative. Um, so this is a normative state as Christians. And I'm reminded of something my father told me when I shared this was happening. He told me that if the devil is leaving you alone, you're either doing wrong or you're not public enough about your faith. And um, I also decided to, because I realized I don't work for anyone. Right? So because I'm in this position where a lot of my Christian brothers and sisters, they don't feel like they can speak up, I decided to sort of lean into the hate. <laughs> so, but, but, so here's the thing. I'll tell you guys right now. The reason why the radical left doesn't like me also is because they will let you produce work if you're whatever, a patriot, a Christian, you know, somebody who's producing traditionality in one sense or other or preserving it and recognizes this, right? Those who want to save the West in their art. If you're producing this type of work, 
they'll let you actually exhibit, if you're painting red, white, and blue bald eagles, uh, the Statue of Liberty in a kitschy way, and presidential figures all stoic. So if you're, if you're producing art in a stereotypical way, then, then you can come into the club of that sort, right? But with me, I'm, I'm into archetypes. I'm into classical figurative standards. And like, they gave me artists of the year, you know, before this happened. So, so I, I felt, um, I think that's a part of it too, because one of my goals here is also to make people see that the counterculture, you know, we talk about dissident artists. Well, what is the dominant narrative? The dominant narrative is atheism, relativism, it's, material, it's all materialism. So I believe that it's, you know, G.K. Chesterton correctly predicted that it would flip, right? This is the counterculture, you know? Instead of, in a punk rock era, you're wearing your leather jacket with the metal spikes, people throwing soda cans at you, right? Go wear a MAGA hat down the Lower East Side, which I've done many times. You'll get the same effect. And when I was in Williamsburg at a, at a coffee shop, I couldn't believe this occurred. I once walked in and, and the barista in front of me with her blue, blue hair and her septum piercing, she tells me to put my cross under my shirt. So it's gonna happen too. So you need to get to this point where you are willing to offend for what's right. So I often believe that Christians, we need a mean streak a little bit. We need to walk with our sword because the devil is counting on your politeness. You know, because you feel this is right and you wanna speak it, but you know that it might hurt their feelings, but you, there's no malice in it. You're not causing property damage. You're not assaulting somebody, right? So I, I believe that um, you don't need to be as bombastic as me, but, <laughs> but it's worth leaning into the hate a little bit. Because art, like morality, consists of drawing the line somewhere. Uh, so um, what are we gonna do about this, my friends? Um, I put together a bunch of these slides to give a more art historical example now. And what I'm gonna show you, because the picture's worth a thousand words, are a bunch of paintings and one sculpture produced by Christian artists when there was nothing closeted about the fact that all of the greatest masterpieces were undergirded by religious subject matter. And then I will show you modern masterpieces in postmodern standards, and I'm not gonna make any straw man here, by their own bias, they regard as their heavyweights. And you don't need some, um, I don't know, uh, dance theory degree or, or, some, or some context to understand this. Your gut will show you, because beauty is, is a self-evident thing, once again. So this is titled Esse Homo, translation from Latin, Behold a Man by Antonio Cicero. Uh, when you see this work, because of the scale of the figures, you feel like you're looking at a window into this, this moment here. It's, it's an absolutely gorgeous painting. This is the Pieta by Michelangelo, of course. A Little bit of background about the Pieta. When Donato Bramante, this very feisty man, he was in charge of rebuilding and demolishing the chapel of Santa Petronilla he allowed thousands of years of art to be burned and destroyed, but not the Pieta. He removed it beforehand. He regarded it as blasphemous when people are appreciating art, um, when that energy should be reserved only for worship and prayer. But he couldn't get rid of the Pieta, <laughs> you know? Um, this is the same reason why when you, the CIA has a secret art exhibition. They have a gallery and collection of art, and when you go to Hitler's confiscated collection, it's all Jewish masterpieces. Because beauty will show you the hypocrisy of your enemies or the wisdom of your allies. And speaking of World War II, I remember reading about when they were considering who to drop the nuclear bomb on, the US that is, uh, the, who was on the list? Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and Kyoto. Well, some of the wiser, older generals, they set up and they demanded to remove Kyoto. Because Kyoto has that beautiful architecture, all that masterfully done sculpture as well. So there's so much pedagogy and wisdom there. And all of the wise men, they demanded to remove Kyoto. Because again, you lose your sense of beauty, you will lose your sense of humanity. It's very important to understand this quality. This is a powerful El Greco with the burial of Count Orgaz. 
The legend goes that St. Augustine himself came down to bury the count because of his Christian deeds. Speaking of holy heroes. This is Albert Durr. Um, anybody who has ever taken an intermediate or advanced drawing course, everyone has to emulate his compositions, but not anymore. 2015, in the East Coast, this practice has ceased because of the oblique spiritual subject matter. It's considered offensive. So Salvador Dali is known for his melting clocks, those uh, melting warped utensils, and painting his wife in these overdramatic poses. But not many people, and it's actually purposely not put out into the mainstream about it, but when he was at the later end of his career, he accepted Christ. And he realized that all this talent and veneration that I have is useless unless I produce something of a deeper density. We'll look at a couple more here. So I could have chosen not hundreds, but thousands of artworks that were created by Christians here. And I just chose some of the ones that I liked. But I'm going to now show you postmodern atheist art. Once again, these are their heavyweights. Seriously, go to a university and open their art history textbooks. These are bookmarked because it's seen as bold and daring. Let's look at some European uh, postmodern masters. You get the idea. It's preposterous and trivial. So how do you go from the divulging of the logos to the encapsulation of the sublime to a banana duct taped to a wall selling for $150,000 in our Basel 2019? Well, it's because as the Russians say, a fish rots from the head down. Because only a person who believes that gender is a social construct can buy this relativist art, right? It's deeply connected. The aesthetics are but the morality. And I don't even need to get into the money laundering or the literal devil artists, like the demonic worshipers of Satan in the art industry. It's a much larger issue that we, the people, even acknowledge as garbage as anything but insulting to our intelligence. Another way this has been repeated is that politics is answered from culture. But I will say that, you know, Dennis Prager has also said this, Andrew Clavin. Um, the problem, though, is that most of them repeat it as an empty mantra. And if you look at the way the conversation always goes, the right will do their spread cheating, the pie charts, they'll put these numbers, and that data is great. We need those red pill men. It gives us this stoic perspective. But the left is expecting that, and they don't bother to even, they don't put one iota of breath in there, right? They're just going to keep moving the goalposts while having absolute ownership of big tech, academia, art gallery, Hollywood, and entertainment. These are all different spheres of influence, and they own this culture. So while we're doing all these numbers here, which we need, they're just going to go right over our heads, <laughs> basically, right? Which is why any time a Christian artist goes into any of, any, any of these different mediums, they're kicked out. So if you want to see where the anti-American elite hang out, look at the fine art world. This is a photo of the art and embassies program. This is where certain billionaires and radical politicians come together. So we have the Rothschilds, Elephantis, Podestas, the Clinton Foundation, just to name a few. Um, for those of you who are a little bit conspiratorial like me, you can, you can do your own research about the art and embassies program 
in conjunction to their relationship with Ghislaine Maxwell's Terramur project. And you'll see that their guise of cultural diplomacy via mass international shipping, which will imply deeper toxic connections. It's important to say that the only reason why this chasm even occurs is because we have lost our ability to see actual financial value based on artistic legitimacy, right? If you look at the Renaissance era, it was very clear, and the vetting system was clear as well. And often, the, the, traditionally, the largest patrons for the arts were wealthy Christian patriarchs. And now it's these people. <laughs> so let me change gears a little bit, too. Um, I want to show you guys the current living artists who are the rock stars now, the world tour artists, the ones who are showing in uh, Berlin, Mexico City, Tokyo, all these top art cities. This is Jeff Koons. Jeff Koons is an open pedophile, and he is, his ex-wife was basically sexually traumatized, and his sculptures stand tall in nearly every metropolitan city in the world. And it's once again because you're either compromised or you're part of the same club. This is Marina Abramovich. She's a literal Satanist witch with her biggest patron, Hillary Clinton. You know, can you imagine being somebody who thinks you're supporting some kids in the Middle East, contributing to the Clinton Foundation, <laughs> and you're actually supporting the promulgation of demonic art? This is Andy Warhol. Um, this one's dead, but worth noting as well. He's another traumatized homosexual. And one of his goals, basically, was leading teenagers astray to self-aggrandizement. And then now he's regarded as a pop icon. This is Patricia Piscinini. This is pretty gross. So even when realism is utilized, because look, usually when atheists or uh, the leftist types, they produce art, they lack formalistic abilities. But even when they do have this rendering ability, the context is deleterious. And she's world famous. She's crushing it. As you can see by artist Kim Noble, the next goal is to normalize pedophilia. And this is the goal of the left. Because if you can hurt children, you'll do anything. Right? And the process will be the same. Change the language with social proof from the creative class. They're going to go right above you. This is why I asked all the kids not to be here, by the way. <laughs> Actually, can we make sure? Yeah, there you go. This is just disgusting. Both of these works belong to the Podestas. And I, I'm not even showing the darkest work they have. They have work that venerates prolific serial killers. I, I'm, I'm serious. Like You can look up the work that they have in their collection. And this is the type of work that they're chanting. And our modern darling of New York City, Hunter Biden. <laughs> you know, George Burgess Gallery, who is laundering his money right now, he took me out for sushi several times. And this is before I knew what was going on here. And it's, you know, I go to the Jane Hotel rooftop bar, and then I see this disheveled character over there. And I, look, I, I got to say, most artists of faith, you know, we're not even obliquely trying to be conservative or anything of the sort. We're just pushed to the right because they keep encroaching on you. And this was another situation where it just was self-evident because I just talked to this character here, assuming he's just another artist that's working with the gallery here, and he's just a user. You can feel it. Poisonous, toxic person. But what can you expect when this is the state of affairs today, right? So there you have it. We're the Costco empire of declines. <laughs> Aimlessly wandering the world in the absence of a philosophy of good and evil. Due to not having a religious model that is attracting the young people. 
So I know I just shared a lot of doom and gloom here. Um, I didn't want to just come here, land, and put beautiful Pogosa Springs and just drop some poison. So I'm going to also show you um, uh, some hope, because there's also a lot of artists of faith that are doing tremendous work. Let me first read this quote by one of my heroes, Roger Scruton. When art becomes merely shock value, our sense of humanity is slowly degraded. The culture of a civilization is the art and literature through which it rises to consciousness of itself and defines its vision of the world. Rest in peace. So this is Emily Verduin. She makes work that is heavily inspired by Christian Orthodox practices. Um, but look at that intricate detail, right? Powerful illustrations, it says it all. This is Vincent Nappi. He's actually a fashion uh, illustrator, and he loves to capture gesture and movement, but he's also incredibly based. And you know, the world of fashion has its own set of demons in it, but it's another um, Leonidas situation where he seems to be the lone voice of reason and faith in this sea of wokeness. This is Eliana Alan. She is a photographer that captures the birth of children with mothers. They're incredibly intimate and mesmerizing Renaissance compositions. And the feminists disdain this lovely woman for capturing women in this beautiful light. The biblical realism of Eric Armisik. Let me also say that every artist I'm showing you now, you know, these are all my friends. Like, none of them, we've all dealt with cancel culture in one way or another. And the only way we're able to have success or our following is by not working with this beast. Every single one I'm showing you. This is Vladimir Kranich. So basically, he's what the abstract expressionists are pretending to be. He actually has technical skill, and he's us utilizing that formalism to create beautiful compositions. And he's been canceled all over Canada as well. So all the artists I just mentioned are a part of this art collective that I started called Genesis Council. We're all faith-based creatives. You know, we have filmmakers, photographers, painters, and we sort of support each other. Um, and I encourage if you are a creative type or know somebody who is an artist of that sort, come on into the club because this might be your tribe. I, I look at us as sort of the uh, rebel alliance, you know? <laughs> we kind of come together and, uh, you know, um, we're going to figure out a way to take down Vader. <laughs> So uh, let me read this quote by Joseph Campbell. Myths are so intimately bound to culture, time, and place that unless the symbols, the metaphors are kept alive by constant recreation through the arts, the life just slips away from them. So this is covering the subject of what the role of the artist is once again. We must recreate images through symbolism and these aesthetic tools that can maintain a modern form of preserving the sacred. So with this quote, what does that mean for yours truly? So I'm currently working on a biblical series. And I'm going to be producing a magnum opus of some sort, uh, 12 large-scale paintings. And you know, I have a lot of eyes on the radical left that look at me. And I want to sort of surprise them with something uh, obliquely Christian into the mainstream. That's the goal here. So I'm going to be producing Genesis, The Fall, Cain and Abel, uh, 12 large-scale paintings, predominantly Old Testament, and the goal is to do sort of a visual Bible tour, right? And I don't want to just say obliquely that I'm trying to evangelize with my art, but it's something of that sort, you know? But I want to utilize beauty. Because once again, to these good men and women here, when we make art, it is better, you know? I'm not, I'm not trying to, you know, speak to my own bias here. It's the reality of art history. You know, we actually believe in art should point upwards. That's the idea of it. And I'll say, while I'm uh, sharing this here, I have to go grassroots on this. I, don't, I no longer have my six art dealers, so I'm also going to reach out to any of you. If you guys know any churches that have event spaces that would be interested in exhibiting something of this sort, you know, inspiring the kids too, 
and, and a cultural uppercut at, in their state locally, please let me know. So I, I really hope, um, in conclusion here, my friends, that I have inspired you to influence in a totally different way. And, you know, to support your local Christian artists and try to have that creative investment come back into the Christian community. And by doing that, my friends, we can restore the sacred and cure the irreverence of the next generation, like Bezalel and El Holayab in Exodus. Save the West. Thank you. So, so I have 15 minutes, right? Okay, I'll, I'll take questions if, if you'd like to do so. You didn't mention it here, but I, I listened to it in your, um, your interview with C.R. Wiley. You mentioned that uh, you kind of go home and secretly look at sacred art because you're being so overwhelmed. This is very private. <laughs> so yeah, when I, when I was in art school, I, I actually, uh, you know, you're surrounded by these um, hedonistic people, and they're all intellectual atheist types, you know, the Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, that type of personality, the know-it-all. And to blend in, I walk and talk like them, right? But, and, and even, this is amongst an art studio in, in George Washington University. And, but secretly, when I would get home, like a, like a pornographic fetish, I would be looking at Christian art. And I wouldn't want them to know I was looking at this because the art, the standard of excellence was so much higher. And this is something that I've heard from so many artists in universities that, you know, it's, it's you can take your friend who's, who, who is not a believer and, you know, take him to like an Orthodox church that's lavish. And he, you're going to want to leave before he does. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's because he's captivated. Um, and that's kind of the experience I had when I was in school, oddly enough. I recall uh, Peterson was asked about Soviet artists. And he said that they uh, were able to create art that transcended you know, the property of it because they were schooled in the uh, technical skills. Uh, uh, do you have a place in America where that sort of thing happens? Say the last part again? Is, is there a place in America where that same technical skill is emphasized? So, so art universities today are pretty much a waste of time. I, mean, I believe in higher education in the arts, but I don't want to do a wholesale write-off, but it tends to be pretty much a brainwashing place for social justice today. When you look at the old style of art education, it was atelier-based, right? So you go to see a master and you're going to apprentice under them. That was the way to do it, because then you get technical training associated with it. Um, art universities were created by the Frankfurt School by a gentleman by the name of John Murphy. He wrote Art and the Social World, and he writes obliquely that the goal of art universities is to change the artist. The art's going to be a political arm rather than a religious one. And he writes that obliquely in his essay. And that's sort of the substrate that's used by a lot of these university professors now. So art university, I wouldn't. Like, I have all this education there. I never use it, <laughs> you know? and, and it, it's, um, you're going to want to find a teacher one-on-one, -on -one, basically, something of that sort, or an academy, maybe. Yeah. Give that name again, the, the book. Art and the Social World. It's, it's a, a part of the essays from the Frankfurt School. The author. John Murphy. I uh, heard once that uh, in Japan, where uh, classical music is uh, revered and uh, people who sell at it, uh, that they're involved with Johann Sebastian Bach and his works. And I've heard that there are Japanese people who have become Christian by virtue of trying to immerse themselves into this man whose music has captivated them. Uh, I'm curious if you're aware of any other people, uh, likewise, who maybe came from 
you know, a, a totally unbelieving background, but through maybe the visual arts, uh, were uh, 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 brought to consider Christ? Well, I, I can answer that very generally, if that's okay. Um, so first, there's a member of our congregation. He collects these old artifacts, and he came to God because he began to have this fascination with biblical scrolls. And the older you go into these scrolls, the more you see images associated with the writing. And he, he got this fascination with it. Um, I put this post up on my social media, of us just looking at them together, and it's, they're really cool. <laughs> just, just, just honestly, they're really cool. So he was attracted to the biblical scrolls because of the images, but he's, you know, now he's a regular attendee of my father's church. Um, but that implies a very deep thing too, which is that, you know, when's the last time, you know, we had, I don't know, maybe like a film like Braveheart or something, you know, that shows traditional masculinity, standing up for what's right and preservation against the beast. You know, the director of Braveheart is, is, is a God-fearing man, you know, and, and that's influenced billions of people, right? Like, when's the last time we've had some, our people go into the culture in the mainstream like that? Um, that's the power, yeah. So I'm a music major in college right now, and my main focus is sort of on class, the classical composition. Um, and so I do some sacred and I do some secular composition, but I'm going to a Christian liberal arts college. I guess, do you have any advice for when I graduate from that college and sort of go more into the mainstream with a different graduate? Yeah, I would love to connect you with my friend. Um, she's in the Genesis Council. Let me just, let me connect you with her. She, uh, she's, class, she's a classically trained person too. She did opera and um, piano, I believe. Um, but she told me that finding the right community for what she believes in, she, now she's an educator, but she had to find a specific type of school. She had to move different state to find that, you know what I mean? So, but, so she couldn't do it in her hometown. But I know about the visual arts pretty well, but I have the counsel, so let, let, me, uh, uh, let me connect you with her. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah, I mean, when you, when you look at rap culture as a phenomenon, this is the most popular form of creative expression today. And the reason why is because today we have this crisis in masculinity, you know? And basically what we see in hip-hop is pseudo-masculinity. Gold chains, lascivious woman around you, you're acting like a musical warlord, right? And, and it's all because... Uh, they never had an example of what fatherhood it really was. And um, I, think, I think once, oh, I don't know what the next form of music would be, but something that can yield their masculinity appropriately, hip hop's gonna naturally just fall into its place. We just don't have anything. That's all it is. You know, uh, Aristotle, not to get um, too philosophical here, but he once said that the two greatest problems in society are from young people in the form of unchanneled male aggression and female vanity, right? And that still applies today. And hip hop is taking care of this thing for the men, right? <laughs> That's right for the men, so. Can you describe your own practice style a little bit for song? Some of the pain sure. I've heard you describe before how thick it is and just like what you, what you do. Um, yeah, so I'm really inspired by the European Impressionists. I think that they were, uh, you know, the spirit of creating a new form of, like a new art movement, I think the Impressionists did it right. They actually crossed the line and did something that's actual bold and daring, not for its own sake. So uh, I got to travel in Bayonac in France and really experience where these Impressionists were born out of. So um, an important thing creatively, a universality, doesn't matter what the medium is, is you need to learn the rules to break the rules, right? So you want to first develop the technical formalistic training and then you, wanna, you can do whatever you want with that tool set. And for me, I was so in love with, you know, uh, I'm gonna be so cliche here, but I love Van Gogh's work too. <laughs> uh, but, but just that whole line of th those painters, that generation, it's like they had rendering abilities, but they were not afraid to experiment with mark making and layering and I don't wanna get too nerdy here, but, but <laughs> they weren't afraid to go into that, that tunnel vision. And, because I'm an artist at heart, that's, you know, I spend eight hours a day in a studio. That's, that's who I really am. Um, that connects with me. Like, how can I play with mark making and not hide my hand? So the Impressionist, it's almost like 
Fauvism, which is a school of Impressionism, meets religious imagery. Like, <laughs> something of that sort, yeah. A lot of your talk is focused on the influence of kind of highbrow or supposed highbrow art. Um, do you also see a danger in uh, the Christians, well, it's a big, like, general Christian uh, uh, love for kitsch as well? Because there, there's also a lack of excellence yeah. there in kind of kitschy, crummy art that that also affects our souls and our minds as well. You just become used to being surrounded by uh, unexcellent things. Yeah, we need to be more nuanced um, because yeah, I'm like I'm not painting like like all my paintings aren't like a strong crucifix, right? Yeah. It, it's it's um, all the artists that I know that are faith-based that are doing really well. Um, they're just public about their beliefs, but they're producing, I mean, the, the values are online. Like that's, that's sort of the, the structure they're painting from, but they're not necessarily painting like oblique Christian subject matter. It's just important to, if someone's gonna ask me about, if a magazine asks me what the series is about, I can tell them the influence and its association to the scripture, but the imagery doesn't have to be. We just need to be public and understand that romanticism is nested in traditionality. It's just understanding that. You know, it's not, um, you can't separate it. And that's what the left is trying to do. So um, that's a vague answer I gave you. But that's the best I can do. <laughs> um, this might not have a simple answer, but um, I was really struck by what you're talking about, about Vladimir Kranich and how there's um, abstract artists are trying to do what he does. Um, and I mean, I'm not a very artistic person, but I'm very struck how sometimes you can think one is pleasing and one is not pleasing. Um, is there a way that like normal people, but like, how would you describe the, the difference between the correct way to do um, is, is sort of art versus the incorrect way? So, so, so Kranich, I mean, even before he became an abstract artist, he was totally figurative. So the elements he's using in his paintings, when you look at his work, it's like, <clears throat> It's almost like if I'm painting, let's say I'm painting a portrait of you, right? And I'm able to capture a certain lighting and, and, and it hits perfectly, I can utilize that across the board, right? It's actually, it's not random is a point. And, and you can tell the quality of an artist by their consistency. You know, if they can actually show that with repeatability. And that's a good indicator. You know, that's a very good indicator, yeah. All right. Thank you guys. Oh. <laughs>